Welcome back. This is my final video on quantum spin, and in this video, I am finally going to talk about the measurement process. Now, anyone will tell you that the measurement process in quantum mechanics is a very strange thing. But in some sense, it's not quite as strange as many people make it out to be. So I think there are a lot of features of quantum measurement which you know confuse people because they're not fully explained in usual introductions to the subject. So in this video, I really want to try to get at, you know, what is a quantum measurement and how does it work? And in order to do that, I'm going to begin by looking at this one example of a quantum measurement, namely the Stern-Gerlach experiment. And by looking at the Stern-Gerlach experiment in a lot of detail, we'll be able to extract some very important lessons about quantum measurement and really get under the hood and see how it works in general. Now, the stern gerlach experiment uh, gives you a way to measure the spin of a particle. So here's the basic setup. So we start with some sort of particle emitter. And the way in which this works isn't, we're not really going to be too concerned about this, but essentially your particle is going to come out of this emitter. It's going to here go be going to the right. And then it's going to enter a zone with a varying magnetic field. So more specifically, let's think about this magnetic field as pointing upwards, so upwards meaning in the z direction. And imagine that the z component of this magnetic field is varying with z, so varying with height. So in other words, the partial derivative of the z component of the magnetic field with respect to the height z is not equal to zero. So the magnetic field is, you know, it could be weaker at the bottom and stronger at the top or something like that. And in a bit, we'll talk about how you could create such a magnetic field. But okay, but yeah, in this orange region, we have a varying magnetic field somehow. And our particle enters this zone, and then depending on whether the particle is spin up or spin down, it's going to either go upwards or go downwards. So for instance, maybe if it's spin up, it'll go up, and if it's down, it'll go down. And then here we have a back wall of some sort, and the particle will then hit the back wall. So if we just send our particle you know, through this device, we can then look in the back wall to see, okay, was it spin up or spin down? Now, let me briefly refresh you on why a varying magnetic field will make the particle go in a different direction depending on its spin. So, in classical mechanics, there is an equation for the force of a magnetic field on a magnetic moment. It's F equals the gradient of mu dot B. So here, mu is the magnetic moment of the particle. And depending on the direction of the spin of the particle, this magnetic moment will be pointed a different direction. So actually, in my last video, I derived this equation uh, in classical mechanics. So if you you know, are curious about where this equation comes from, you can watch my last video. And at the end of uh, my last video, I, sh I gave a derivation of where this comes from. But let's just take it as a given for here. Now, you may or may not remember that in classical physics, this magnetic moment vector mu for a charged spinning particle is equal to the charge of the particle Q over 2m times the angular momentum vector of the particle. Now, in quantum mechanics, you know, for an electron, for instance, there's this other factor out front called g, where g is the g factor, and it's approximately equal to 2 for reasons having to do with special relativity and stuff, but I talked about that in a previous video too, so let's not get into that. But yeah, so in any case, if the particle intuitively is spin up, then the magnetic moment vector is pointed up. So let's say 
you know, that that was the case. Then this mu vector would have components of zero, zero, and then it's magnitude mu. So this is, you know, just sort of thinking intuitively if the particle is, is pointed up. Now, in this case, the force on the particle F is equal to the gradient of, and now you see mu dot B is just going to be mu as in, you know, the magnitude of the mu vector, so mu times b sub z. So mu times the z, the z component of the magnetic field. And now we can actually just rewrite this as mu times the gradient of b sub z. And if we're imagining, you know, let's say that this is only varying with height, let's just say that, you know, b sub z only depends on z, then this equals mu times partial b sub z, partial z. Yeah, so we can see that there's going to be a force on this particle if, you know, the magnetic field is changing. More, and furthermore, if the particle was spin down, if it was pointed in the other direction, then we would have a minus sign here, right? We'd have a, it would be pointed uh, downwards, and there would be a minus sign here, a minus sign here, and a minus sign here. So if the particle is spin up, the force will be in the opposite direction from the particle is spin down. All right, so let me just clear a little bit of this stuff off. Let me get rid of this too. Now, that was a bit of classical intuition, but let's talk about what happens quantum mechanically. So quantum mechanically, the state of our particle is going to be given by a vector of two functions. So we'll have one function called the spin-up wave function and another function called the spin-down wave function. The spin-up wave function, you know, depends on time and the spatial coordinate x. Same thing for the spin down one. And this will tell you the probability density of finding your particle spin up or spin down in a particular location at a particular time. So for instance, the absolute value of the spin up wave function of T and X squared this is the probability density of finding the particle to be spin up, you know, with respect to the z direction. So this, so when I'm saying spin up and spin down, I implicitly mean with respect to the z direction. To be spin up at location x at time t. And then, you know, for the spin down wave function, you know, the same thing would give you the probability density of finding the particle spin down at location x at time t. Now, I talked about this a lot in my last video, but in many cases, you can think about particles and quantum mechanics as traveling in Gaussian wave packets. So these wave functions will be these, you know, little complex uh, wave packets, you know, traveling with some velocity and, you know, the absolute value kind of has like a bell curve shape. And let's say we're drawing this spin up wave function in red, or like maybe, let's say we're drawing the real part of the spin up wave function in red and the real part of the you know, sp spin down wave function in blue. So it'll be right on top of each other, basically. So when the particle is emitted, the spin up and spin down wave functions, you know, will, will be like the same function. But as the wave packet continues to travel to the right and enters the zone of varying magnetic field, then the spin up wave function and the spin down wave function will evolve in different ways. The spin up wave function will sort of go basically on this upward trajectory and the spin down wave function 
will go on this downward trajectory. So that means, for instance, that if you look at, say, this position right here, so like this position in space x right here, um, the value of the spin-up wave function at this particular position will be pretty appreciable. Um, but meanwhile, the value of the spin-down wave function at this position will be very small, will be negligible. So, you know, and meanwhile, at this particular position here, um, at, you know, the time in which the wave packet is, you know, getting there, the, the value of the spin-up wave function at this position will be negligible. Meanwhile, the, the value, the absolute value of the spin-down wave function here will be appreciable. So in other words, you know, once you've gotten to this point in time when the wave packets are kind of like this, um, there's a lot of probability that, the spin, that if the particle is spin up, it's going to be, you know, in this region up here. And if the particle is spin down, it's going to be in this region down here. But they'll be spatially separated. Now, while talking about this, there's something I want to point out. Classically, when you have that the magnetic moment vector is proportional to the uh, angular momentum of your spinning particle, you know, your spinning particle in classical mechanics, you know, could be spinning in any direction. Like, this L thing could be anything. So, you know, the particle could be spinning up like that, or it could be spinning at an angle, or so, you know, so on and so forth. And in classical mechanics, you would instead inspect, instead of getting these two different, uh, you know, places where the particle could hit the back wall, instead because the angular momentum could, you know, really be, have any value. It could, the particle could hit the back wall at any of these, at any of these, uh, you know, z coordinates. But the thing is that in quantum mechanics, a particle can only be spin up or spin down with respect to a particular axis. And because we have that, you know, there's a force that, depends on the spin of the particle, and there's only two options for the spin of a particle in one direction. Because of quantum mechanics, it can only go on the up path or the down path. But this was originally very confusing for people. They didn't realize, they couldn't figure out, like, wait, why is the particle only hitting the back wall at, like, you know, two locations? Why couldn't it be, like, any location? And this was one of the experiments that really got people to realize, wait a second, there's this thing called spin, and it has all this these properties, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, there's nothing special in particular about the z-direction. It's because we specifically made, you know, this magnetic field to have some changing z-component in the z-direction that is singling out the z-direction. If we had instead, you know, made a different apparatus with maybe instead of, you know, instead it had some, the magnetic field was mostly in the x-direction and this change with x, then we would be measuring the component of the spin along different directions. And um, yeah, so it, it does, it's not like a fundamental fact that, you know, there's nothing special about the z direction fundamentally. It's just more of uh, how we set up this particular device. But the point is that you have to pick some axis along which to measure your spin. And once you pick some axis, there are only two possible spins for that axis. Now, there's something really important I have to bring up about how the Stern-Gerlach experiment was originally done uh, historically. See, in the original Stern-Gerlach experiment, they used silver atoms, right? They didn't use electrons. So throughout this series, I've usually talked about, you know, single electrons with spin. But they, they used silver atoms. And in fact, this experiment wouldn't really work if you just use electrons. And the reason that it wouldn't work if you used electrons is because of the Lorentz force law. So the Lorentz force law, if you recall, is that the force on a moving charge in a magnetic field is Q, the charge V, cross the magnetic field B. So here we have, you know, in this experiment, if this particle were an electron, we would have a moving charge in an external magnetic field. It would feel some deflection force, and this force would actually be pretty strong. In other words, you know, it would get deflected off to some crazy direction and wouldn't hit the, the back wall nicely like this, right? And the thing is that this deflection wouldn't depend on the spin of the particle, right? Both particles would basically be deflected by the, the, the Lorentz force law 
in the same way. So in order that we don't you know, get this extra deflection in some crazy uh, you know, other direction, we use electrically neutral silver atoms. Right? Silver atoms have the same amount of positive charge as they have negative charge. So whereas this Q for an electron you know, wouldn't be zero, for a silver atom it would be zero. Now at this point, a lot of you are probably scratching your heads and saying, you know, hmm, well, well, wait a second. All of this stuff that we've talked about up until now, you know, how electrons, for instance, have magnetic moments and so forth, you know, this all applied to elementary particles like an electron. But a silver atom is not an elementary particle. It's made up of many other particles. You know, it's made up of electrons and protons and neutrons. So, so how can we really just treat a silver atom in much the same way that we were sort of thinking about electrons, you know, with just a single spin. And it turns out that it's important that we have specifically here a silver atom and not, you know, any arbitrary atom. See, there's something important about silver atoms, which is that, well, the atomic number of silver is 47, so there are 47 protons and therefore 47 electrons. But more importantly, if you look at how many uh, electrons are in each shell, each orbital shell of the silver atoms, it turns out that the silver atom has one valence electron. So it has one electron in the unfilled shell. And I know we haven't talked at all about atoms and shells and stuff, but, you know, just kind of take it in and, you know, see what you can, see what you can glean from this discussion. So, if, you know, you have some silver atom and it has all of these, you know, paired up electrons in its filled shells. So when electrons pair up, you have one spin down and one spin up and, you know, these get grouped together. So you have all of these paired electrons. But then after all of that, at the end of the day, you still have one unpaired electron. And the thing is that these paired electrons actually cancel out. So the angular momentum of the paired electrons, you know, you have one spin up and one spin down, those cancel out. And it's really just this extra leftover valence electron in the unfilled shell that accounts for the spin of the whole silver atom. Now, you know, you might also wonder like, wait, what about the protons and neutrons? Those are also spin one half particles. You know, what about those? And the thing is like, yes, okay, that's absolutely true. Protons and neutrons do have, um, you know, spin and they have magnetic moments. But the thing is that, see how this magnetic moment is like basically the, the charge times L over 2M? So in quantum mechanics, these spin one half particles all have an L, an angular momentum of basically H bar, H bar over 2, yeah. So H bar being Planck's reduced constant. And the electron and the proton both have the same angular momentum, you know, H bar over two. But the thing is that the electron has a much smaller mass. See, the proton is about 2,000 times the mass of an electron. So therefore, the magnetic moment of a proton is going to be much less. And therefore, the force, you know, on the silver atom due to the magnetic moment of the protons and the neutrons, that's not really going to matter nearly as much as it will um, as due to this tiny little, you know, one valence electron. So all told, you can really just, you know, treat the silver atom as just having a spin given by one valence electron. But it turns out there's actually one other more important thing which is that this valence electron is in the S state of the atom. Now, I can't really get into it now, but, but basically, you know, there are different shells to the, to the um, you know, that the electrons can be in. There's like S, which is the lowest one, and there's P and D and so forth. And as the electron is in a bigger and bigger shell, it's basically like it's further and further away from the nucleus. So like if maybe this is the nucleus, you know, as the electron is, has a smaller and smaller shell, you know, S is the smallest shell, and the electron is sort of closest to the nucleus, then for the bigger shells, it kind of gets further away. 
But more importantly, this S shell actually, if you, when you think about it, you shouldn't really think of it as orbiting the atom. So whereas the other shells have electrons you know, orbiting the atom, they're sort of classically, you can think of them as orbiting like a planet, but really, really they're more like, you know, you know, the whole wave function is surrounding the atom in some way. And I mean, it's sort of like spinning in some sense. There's going to be some more. Anyway, I don't really want to get into it. But the point is that the point is that only the S orbit orbital has no orbital angular momentum. So therefore, you know, you really can just think of as as the intrinsic spin uh, angular momentum from the electron. And there's no extra funny business from the fact that, you know, well, maybe the electron has orbital angular momentum. Um, if it was in a different shell, then yeah, it would. But that's not the case for silver. So silver is really the go-to atom for the stern gerlach experiment here. All right. Now, the next thing I want to discuss is the magnetic field in the stern gerlach experiment. So, you know, how does it get there? In particular, I said that there was a region of space in which there was a varying magnetic field. So now I want to discuss how an experimentalist would actually create a region of space with a varying magnetic field. So in order to do that, let's briefly remember how a ferromagnet works, a permanent magnet, like the sort of magnet that you'd find on your refrigerator magnet. So in a magnetic material, like a ferromagnet, what ends up happening is this material will have a bunch of atoms, and these atoms will each have a spin. And in a ferromagnetic material, what happens is all the spins, for reasons having to do with the property of the material, will all be aligned in the same direction. So throughout this series of videos, I've usually been thinking about the behavior of spins in an external magnetic field. You know, an example, you know, in the stern gerlach experiment, we're thinking of a single atom being influenced by an external magnetic field. But it's important to remember that, uh, you know, particles with spin also create magnetic fields, right? So for instance, in our toy model of a loop of current, you know, this loop of current also creates its own magnetic field around it. Um, and we haven't been thinking about that, but it's important to remember that, that that happens too. So in particular, the direction that these you know, spins are pointed in will be the direction of the magnetic field there. So within the magnet, the magnetic field lines are going to look kind of like this. They're going to be bunched together and all pointed in the same direction of the spins, which are all aligned with each other. So this will be, so these are the field lines of the magnetic field B. Now let me ask, what are these magnetic field lines going to look like outside of the magnet? So if we draw the magnet here again, we know that inside the magnet, the magnetic field lines are going to look like this, all close to each other and bunched up together. Okay. And to complete the picture, all that we have to do is remember that the magnetic field is divergenceless. So this is one of Maxwell's laws. Sometimes people say it's uh, the same thing as saying that there are no magnetic monopoles. But pictorially, it means that the field lines of the magnetic field don't start or end anywhere. So now, if we just try to complete the picture in such a way that these field lines don't start or end anywhere, we're going to naturally get a picture that looks kind of like this. So these ones are going to have to loop back around that. 
And the one in the middle will uh, go off to infinity. So it's okay for the field lines to go off to infinity because, you know, that's not really starting or ending anywhere. And yeah, we have to also draw arrows to indicate the direction of the field. Okay, so now that we've remembered how magnets work, let me ask you a question. What if instead of having a rectangular shaped magnet, what if we had a pointed shaped magnet? So it kind of looked like this, like a house. Well, we know that inside of the magnet, we have to draw all the field lines right next to each other and bundled up together like this. I'll draw little arrows. Okay. And next, we know that we have to connect up all the field lines so that none of them start or end anywhere. They all loop around. So that will look kind of like this. Okay, that's pretty good. Now, note how the field lines are bending away from the magnet in this pointed region here. So, um, actually, let me let me draw that explicitly. So, let me just move this over here, and let me just draw a here a you know rectangular top of a magnet like this and then versus a pointed top of a magnet. Out of the rectangular magnet the, f the field lines will look like this okay and then out of the pointed top the field lines will look like this. They'll kind of bend away uh, right after they exit the magnet. So, so you see how they're, how they're bending away sooner they're spreading out more right near the magnet than here? I see these field lines are spreading out more uh, right near the magnet in the pointed uh, case rather than in the uh, rectangular case. So now that we're familiar with how the magnetic field is affected by the pointed shape of the magnet, let's think about what the magnetic field will look like for this configuration of magnets, which I am about to draw. All right, so uh, I just made these drawings, and let's first look at this picture I have on the right here. So here I have this sort of 3D picture of these two magnets. I've labeled where the north and the south poles are, uh, of both magnets, and you can see that this top one has a pointed shape, and this bottom one has a rectangular shape. So you see that they're also, you know, long. They're they're sort of long in this way, but you know, we'll get to that in a second. So if we look at a cross section, it will look like this uh, picture right here. So we can see that the top magnet, right, which has the north pole you know, on the bottom, the field lines coming out of the, the top pointed magnet will splay out um, from the magnet, you know, uh, uh, a lot because, you know, it's a pointed magnet. But on the bottom one, because it's a rectangular shape, it won't spl splay out as much. So you can see that the field lines will kind of come out of the top one and then splay out and then go into the bottom one. Now, if we were to have had two rectangular magnets, right, without a pointed shape, then the field lines would have basically just went straight down. There wouldn't really have been any displaying out. So why is this important? Well, due to this splaying out, you can see that the field lines are more dense up top, and they are less dense on the bottom. And this is all because we have a pointed magnet up top, but 
a rectangular magnet on the bottom. Now, because the density of field lines is proportional to the strength of the magnetic field, you can see that the magnetic field is stronger, you know, up top, like stronger up here and weaker on the bottom. So that means that, you know, as you can see, well, maybe if we're looking at sort of like this region here, you know, in this region here, the magnetic field is pointed down. There's only a, a Z component to the magnetic field. But the magnetic field at like this point, for instance, is going to be stronger than the magnetic field at this point. So that means that we can see that basically there's a magnetic field only pointed in the Z direction. And partial B sub Z over partial Z is not equal to zero. Right, for this, for this configuration here. Whereas for this configuration here with two rectangular magnets, we would instead have that partial B over partial Z. Well, that would basically be, that'd basically be equal to zero, right, for this configuration. So, okay, what does this have to do with the stern gerlach experiment? Well, as you might have guessed, if we create this configuration of magnets, like this, like I've drawn for us. All right. And then we have our particle emitter that emits our you know, electron. This will be the region, or okay, any or silver atom or whatever. This will be the region which will create the varying magnetic field, which will make the electron or the particle or whatever, you know, bend upwards or downwards. So in other words, this, this apparatus, this pointed and non-pointed magnet is how you create this region of a magnetic field uh, that I was talking about earlier. So now I have fully described to you, you know, how the different elements of the stern gerlach experiment work. With that final piece of the puzzle, you know, squared away now, I now want to talk about some more general aspects of quantum measurement. And because we, you know, can understand how the stern gerlach experiment works now, um, we now have some sort of basis to understand some more general things about quantum measurement. So now I'm going to talk more generally about quantum measurement, now that we have sort of understood all the components of the stern gerlach experiment. So. Lessons to be learned about quantum measurement. Okay. So when I introduced the measurement process in my first video in the series, I said that if you have the state psi with components alpha and beta, and you measure the spin of the state along the z-axis, the probability of detecting the spin to be spin up would be the absolute value of alpha squared, and the probability of detecting it to be spin down would be the absolute value of beta squared. Now, from my description back then, it sounded like measurement was an instantaneous process. You know, that one moment your state hadn't been measured and the next moment it had been measured. But this should have, you know, seemed a bit weird because in general we expect processes to take time. That includes measurement. Measurement is a process and it seems as though that should take some length of time. And the first thing I want to point out that we can see pretty clearly from the stern gerlach experiment is that indeed measurements take a length of time to perform. They're not instantaneous processes. And we can see that straight from the fact that, you know, once the particle is emitted, it has to, 
you know, it takes a bit of time for it to travel from the emitter all the way to the back wall. You know, this, this process takes some time. Now, the next thing I want to address is that, technically speaking, our measurement is not 100% accurate. And here's what I mean by that. So, you know, we've sort of been drawing these, you know, trajectories that the particle will go on. It'll hit the back wall, you know, maybe, maybe at this position or at this position. But we know that the particle doesn't travel along a well-defined trajectory. It, you know, travels as a little wave packet. And this wave packet will have some position uncertainty. So, for instance, maybe the spin-up wave function, you know, the absolute value of the squared, in terms of its z-dependence, you know, it can be proportional to something like e to the negative z squared, or rather, maybe z minus z naught squared over 2 sigma squared, where z naught is, you know, maybe one of these positions here, and sigma is the position uncertainty. So really what it'll look more like is there'll be these sort of two Gaussian bumps. Right. And, you know, this is where the top particle, this is where the spin-up uh, particle would hit, and this is where the spin-down particle would hit. But you can see that as the value of z gets far away from, you know, this bottom position here, this top position here, it doesn't actually go literally to zero. It just drops really, really low. So there is actually some non-zero probability that this spin down particle here could actually be found, you know, up here. It's a pretty small probability, um, especially, I mean, because the value of z is going to be much further away from the peak than sigma, but it's still some non-zero probability nonetheless. Having said that, you can still get the measurement to be as precise as you want by making the two magnets, you know, longer and longer. So, you know, if you're the, the magnets that the particle will pass between, if we keep making just, you know, the length, you know, the length of these magnets longer and longer, then the particles will, you know, will split further and further apart from each other. So, you know, if we make them even longer, you know, maybe one peak, you know, will be all the way over here, and the other peak will be all the way over here. So we can, we can see how we can make the measurement as, as precise as we want by, you know, doing stuff to the device. And it should also be said that um, the longer we make this, the, lo the longer it'll take for this measurement to occur. So you can see that, you know, if we were to say, you know, you know, cut the experiment in half right here and make it shorter, then there would be more overlap between the wave functions. But if we do the full length of the experiment, you know, then there'll be less and less overlap. So in, in this case, the longer that the measurement takes to perform, the better and better it's getting. So the next lesson is that measurements may not be 100% accurate. Now, there's another point I would like to make, which might be pretty obvious too, but I just want to emphasize it anyway. Measurement is not some mystical, magical thing. You know, some poor experimentalist had to actually figure out how to build this apparatus and how to actually conduct these measurements in real life. So while we may often speak in terms of, you know, poly matrices and linear operators and, you know, solving for eigenvectors and eigenvalues or what have you, you know, these are just intangible mathematical abstractions. Nobody has ever seen a poly matrix in the real world. Nobody has ever you know, seen an eigenvalue. People have seen magnets. And in fact, creating these real world, real world measurements takes a lot of knowledge about the physics of the object you're trying to measure. And it takes a lot of 
know, creativity in order to actually pull it off. So this third lesson is that measurement is not some mystical thing. So there's one last lesson I'd like to say uh, that's going to be a lot more involved than the other three. So let me first write it out and then I'll you know, go into more detail. So this last lesson is measurement works by entangling the degree of freedom you want to measure with some other degree of freedom. Now, this is the first time I've used the word entanglement in my series here. So, I, many of you might not understand everything I'm about to say right now, but you know, just try your best. So, actually, let me make a new Okay, new screen. So, this is all about the role of entanglement in quantum measurement. So, Now, the Stern-Gerlach experiment is meant to measure the spin of a particle, i.e. what a physicist might call the spin degree of freedom. However, in order to do this, it exploits a totally different degree of freedom, namely the spatial position of the particle. So this is actually how all quantum measurements work. You use some degree of freedom you're not particularly interested in, here it's the position of the particle, in order to measure the degree of freedom that you are interested in, which here is the spin. So what do I mean by that? Let's first think about a particle with some position uh, but no spin. So position without spin. In other words, this particle can you know, have some location in space, but you know, we're not describing its spin. So the state of, you know, this particle would just be given by a single wave function. So in other words, it takes this wave function takes in a position vector and outputs a single complex number. So a state is a function which takes in a single vector in R3, three real numbers, and outputs a complex number. So we might write the state, you know, like this, like a this is the wave function. Now this is the state of a particle with position and no spin, but what about spin without position? So it's kind of a funny thing to say, but this is sort of like what we were doing uh, in our first few videos in this series. You know, we were just describing the spin of the particle and not worrying about its location. So in that case, our state is just a vector with two complex numbers for components. So, so our state will just be a single complex vector. So, in other words, it will be an element of the vector space C2, you know, C2 complex numbers. And maybe we could, you know, write this state as, I don't know, well, psi spin, that's just my notation for, for this vector here. Now, 
What about in the case that our particle has both spin and position? Then our state is given by two wave functions. So a spin up wave function and a spin down wave function. So in other words, it's a vector of wave functions. So now we can think about our state as being a map. So this state, well, how should I write this? I guess I will just write uh, our state. I'm sort of reusing this. Uh, oh, <laughs> the state is a map from R3 to C2. It takes in a position and outputs two complex numbers, a vector of complex numbers. OK, now why did I write all this out? I wrote all this out because I'm trying to bring to your attention that in a pretty precise way, if you multiply the position notion of a state with the spin notion of a state, you get a notion of a state that incorporates both spin and position. So at this point, I now have to introduce the concept of a Hilbert space. And that sounds sort of intimidating, but it's not really. So let's first look, well, okay, let's first look at the spin uh, state. So you see how all states are just two-dimensional complex vectors? We can say that, you know, every state lives in something that I'll call H sub spin. Now, this is the Hilbert space. This is what you might call the Hilbert space describing the spin degree of freedom. All it is, is it's just a set of all of the two-dimensional complex vectors. So in this case, H sub spin, it's just the same thing as C2, all the two-dimensional complex vectors. Now, what about the position degree of freedom? Well, the position state also lives in a Hilbert space. And let's denote this as H position. And this Hilbert space is equal to all of the functions from R3 to C. So I haven't really I haven't really said anything yet. All I've done is defined the the space of states where here this sort of describes this describes what I might call the position degree of freedom and the spin degree of freedom. Now, this notion of a state which has both spin and position lives in a Hilbert space. Well, I'll just call it H, the full Hilbert space. And, and this is really why it's good to you know, define these Hilbert spaces. Because there's an operation. Well, I'll just write it out. So the full H is equal to H sub position and then tensor product h sub spin. So the nice thing about these Hilbert spaces is that you can tensor product them together to get a bigger Hilbert space. And in some sense, this tensor product, you know, and this symbol is just a circle with like an x in it, this sort of multiplies Hilbert spaces together. So if you multiply the position degree of freedom by the spin degree of freedom, you know, then you get you know, you know, both degree of, degrees of freedom in one Hilbert space. And, you know, this Hilbert space H is just all of the functions from, you know, R3 to C2. Now, um, at this point, I guess I should give a very brief introduction to the tensor product. So, you know, so obviously won't be a full treatment, but, you know, I'll just talk for a minute about uh, what the tensor product is. So, So, the, 
the tensor product, and the symbol is this circle with an X. So in some sense, the tensor product is an operation that just sort of mushes two things together. It just sort of smashes, you know, two sorts of things together. And, you know, you just sort of say they obey some rules. So I think it's easy to, easier to see with some examples. So for instance, the spin-up state, this lives in H sub spin. The spin down state, you know, also lives in H sub spin. And let's say we have two different wave functions. Um, I'll write it, them as psi up. This is just a single function. I've, I'm just sort of labeling it psi up. And let's say this lives in just h sub position. So it just it outputs a single complex number. And let's also say that psi down is a wave function that outputs a single complex number, and this also lives in h sub position. So what this tensor product symbol does is it says that you can take a state in you know one Hilbert space, you know, maybe h sub, you know, say h sub position, and you could take a state in h sub spin, and you just sort of smash them together using this tensor product thing right here. So say that we take the wave function labeled psi spin up, and we tensor it together with the spin up state. Now, this can be thought of as a state which lives in H sub position tensored with H sub spin. You know, there's not really anything else to say. This is just sort of a, a gluing uh, symbol that, you know, makes a new thing. And that can be kind of confusing for people because they might sort of ask, like, well, wait a second, what really is the tensor product? You know, it just, it is this. It lets you take two states and just sort of mush them together. But there's something else interesting about the tensor product, which is that you can add together two things which have been tensored product, which have been tensored together. <laughs> so let's also say we take the spin down lab, uh, wave function and we tensor that together with the spin down state. Now the thing that you know some people get confused by is that this is completely loud. So you can both tensor stuff together and then add stuff that has been tensored together. And this, in fact, is a totally general state that lives in this Hilbert space, h sub position tensor h sub spin. In other words, for any um, state that lives in this Hilbert space, you can always write it in this form with some sort of you know, state here and some sort of you know, state here. Now, because of that, because we can write every state in this form, we can just say, well, you know, there's going to be one sort of wave function which is, you know, attached to the spin up state and one wave function that's attached to the spin down state. So therefore all states are in a way just given by two different wave functions. And therefore we can rewrite the state like this, you know, one wave function up top and one wave function in the bottom, you know, a two component wave function. And it's a two component wave function because h sub spin is a two dimensional vector space. Now, there's one final thing I should mention about the tensor product, which is that it has what is called the distributive property. So, what do I mean by that? Well, in regular multiplication, the distributive property is that a times b plus c equals a times b plus a times c. In other words, you can bring the multiplication uh, into the parentheses 
and you know, act with it on both of the things that are being added. So the same thing is true of this tensor product. So in our example here, if you have some wave function and then tensor producted with an arbitrary sum of a spin up state and a spin down state, so here alpha and beta are two complex numbers, and this is an arbitrary you know, spin state. We can distribute the tensor product among the additions, so we can rewrite this as alpha, the coefficient, times the wave function tensored with the spin up state, and then, well, I'm running out of space, plus beta times the wave function again, tensored with the spin down state. So this is called the distributive property, and it's another, you know, rule that this tensor product has. Okay, so now that I have probably confused you, let's return back to the physics, which should hopefully uh, be a bit more understandable. So now let me redraw the stern gerlach experiment with a few things labeled. So here we have our magnetic field, and you know here we have the path of the particle. But now let me label three wave functions. So here I have three Gaussian wave packets. You know, I'm just sort of drawing the profile of the wave packet. And let me label this, you know, this wave packet here, which has a velocity, you know, moving to the right and everything. Let me call this psi initial, so that little i is for initial. And I'll label this one over here psi initial. And then I'll label this one up here psi final up. And this one here psi final down. So when I say these are wave functions, I mean they are single component wave functions, not two component wave functions. So for instance, psi initial is a function from R3 to C, not R3 to C2. So I'm just sort of labeling these wave packets, these little wave functions with psi initial, psi final up and psi final down. In order to get two component wave functions, you've got to tensor these together with the spin up and spin down states. Now let's think about this particular state, psi initial tensored together with the spin up state. Now this state has, you know, the position state of this, you know, psi initial, this wave packet over here, and, and it's spin up. Now under time evolution, so under time, whoops, evolution, this state here will evolve into psi final up tensored with the spin up state. So, you know, by time evolution, I just mean that the state moves to the right, then it enters this magnetic field here, and then, you know, evolving via Pauli's equation, which we talked about in the last video, it'll, you know, get moved up. Now, the other option is that we have psi initial tensored with the spin down state and then under time evolution this becomes psi final down tensored with the spin down state. So now that we looked at these two cases, let me now ask about what happens to, you know, the general initial state, you know, starts psi initial and then tensored with alpha times spin up plus beta times spin down. So this is a state which, you know, starts out here, you know, moving to the right and everything, 
but it has an arbitrary spin state. So by the distributive property, this equals alpha times psi initial tensored with the spin up state plus beta times psi initial tensored with the spin down state. Now the question I'm posing is what does this state become under time evolution? So note that this state is just you know the complex number alpha times this you know initial state right here plus the complex number beta times this state right here. The important thing to realize is that time evolution is linear. So, I mean, as I've discussed previously, if you have the Hamiltonian H, time evolution is given by exponentiating the Hamiltonian H. And importantly, this thing right here, this is just a linear operator. So, you know, I don't wanna, you know, get into too much detail if you, you know, haven't seen this before, you know, you can watch some of my previous videos, but the main important thing is that if you have a linear combination of two states, those under time evolution, time evolve into the linear combination, you know, of the time evolution of the, of the two things it was a sum of. So that was kind of confusing, but, you know, it just means that in this case, this time evolves into alpha times psi f up, oh, I should have wrote of x there, well, oh well, alpha, you know, psi f up tensored with spin up, and then plus beta times psi f down tensored with the spin down state, right? Because you can just time evolve this thing, time evolve this thing, and add them together. Okay. Let me just get rid of this. Okay, so I want you to notice something interesting about you know these two different states over here. So this state here is just the tensor product of one state with another state, right? You take two states and you tensor them together. Now, this final state isn't like that, you see, because, well, here you have a tensor of one thing, another thing, but then there's a sum, and then the tensor of another thing, another thing. So the state on the left is just the tensor of two things, but the state on the right isn't, because there's this sum here. Now you might be saying, well, wait a second. If you distribute the tensor product, couldn't you say that this state here is also the sum of two things that are, you know, the tensor product, you know, just like we did earlier? And the answer is yes, but importantly, this state can be written as just the tensor of two states, which is a very special property. And this final state here, the state on the right, that cannot be, that cannot be done with this state here. In other words, there's no way to write this state as, you know, just the tensor of one state with another state. And the reason for that is, is very simple. It's just because psi f up as a function is not equal to psi f down, right? And more importantly, I suppose, it's that they're actually not proportional to each other. So if this is the symbol for proportional to, they're not proportional to each other. So if you were to, you know, do out this distribution here, you would get, you know, well, alpha, you get alpha psi initial for the spin up, and you'd get beta psi initial for the spin down. But importantly, these two things would be proportional to each other, right? Because, I mean, alpha and beta are, 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 are complex uh, constants, not functions, right? But, so yeah, so it's very special that this state on the left here can be written as the tensor product of two states and the state on the right can't. Now, it's at this point that I'm finally going to introduce a very important 
uh, piece of terminology. You see, this state on the right here is what we would call entangled, whereas this state on the left here is what we would call not entangled. So we say that a state is entangled when it cannot be written as just the tensor product of two states. If you've got to have a plus sign somewhere in there, you know, between the tensor products, then we say it's entangled. Now, a helpful way to think about what entanglement means is that you can think of it as a lot like being correlated. So entanglement is sort of like correlation. So obviously there's a lot of stuff to entanglement. I don't want to just say entanglement is correlation, but it's, it's a good start. So you see, if you have a state that's entangled, it means that you know one degree of freedom of this state is correlated with another one. So in this case, we can see that the position of the particle is correlated with whether it's spin up or spin down. So if you have, so you know, if you take this state and you happen to find it, you know, up here, if you happen to find it up here, then that, you know, means that it's spin up. Its position is correlated with its spin. That's what this sum here really means. Whereas for this other state here, the one that's not entangled, um, if you know something about its position, that doesn't actually tell you anything about its spin. See, if it's spin up or if it's spin down, its position state is going to be the same. So entanglement is really just like correlation. So thinking back to the stern gerlach experiment, we can see that the role of the stern gerlach experiment is to take you know, a particle state where the position and the spin degree of freedom are not entangled. And to use this clever apparatus that then entangles the position degree of freedom with the spin degree of freedom. So we see that the role of this measurement apparatus is to take a state which is not entangled and then entangle it. So measurement is really like entanglement, which is a lot like correlation. So the point of a measurement is to correlate the degree of freedom you want to measure, which here is spin, with some other degree of freedom, which here is the position of the particle. That's what a measurement really is, if you think about it. <laughs> now, this is a very important point about measurement, that measurement works you know, through entanglement. And even if you didn't understand everything I've been talking about, you know, just tuck this in the back of your head and maybe a bit later, you know, when you get older, you realize like, wow, okay, yeah, now I get it. <laughs> um, uh, let me mention something else about entanglement, which is that here I've sort of defined entanglement as a binary thing. Like this state here is entangled. This state isn't entangled. And it is true that entanglement, the, you know, whether or not a state is entangled, that's binary, but you can also sort of make, you know, uh, measurements of how entangled something is, like gradations. So, you know, even if, some, even if something is entangled, it's possible for it to not be entangled very much. And, you know, the way you can sort of see it is in this example, um, it has to do with the inner product of psi f up and psi f down. So if we take the inner product of, of you know, these two things, and, you know, I, let's just say we take the absolute value of this squared. Yep. This is just sort of an impromptu measurement of entanglement, but, you know, it's pretty good for now. Uh, if, this, if this inner product is much less than one, so there's like almost no overlap between, between this and this, then we would say that that, uh, that this state is very entangled. I mean, so that would make that would be a good measurement if this inner product is really small, much less than one. That would mean the state is very entangled. 
But if the state was, but if this uh, overlap was maybe more like, oh, I don't know, say it was like 0.8, like pretty close to one, then that would be actually not a very good measurement. That would mean there'd be a lot of overlap. The state would be entangled, but it wouldn't really be that entangled. So, yeah, so there, are, there is such a thing as gradations of entanglement. Now, there's one very important final thing I have to talk about. And unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about it in a completely satisfactory way. But I now want to discuss quantum measurement collapse. Now, we just discussed how the psi initial tensored with the alpha spin up plus beta spin down state becomes alpha times psi final up tensored with spin up plus beta times psi final down tensored with spin down. Yeah, we just described, you know, how this happens. But if you really think about it, this right here is not really what happens during a measurement. Because this state here is a superposition of the particle both, you know, being, you know, here on the wall and spin up and here on the wall and spin down. Right? This is a superposition of these two eventualities. But that's not what we see. What we actually see when we do a measurement is we either see the particle here or we see the particle here. So instead of having a 100% chance of this evolving into this, you know, what we actually see is an absolute value of alpha squared probability of this evolving into psi final up tensored with spin up and an absolute value of beta squared probability of evolving into psi final down tensored with spin down. So why does this happen? Why don't we see this final state but instead we see one of its two components with some probability. Now, some of you might have noticed that this question I'm asking here, why don't we see the superposition but only its components? This is essentially uh, Schrodinger's cat paradox. You know, why can't you see the cat in the half dead, half alive state? Why do you, why do you only see it in the alive or the dead state? So this is sort of, you know, a mini version of, of that problem. Now, I won't be able to give you a fully satisfactory explanation of why this is. And that's because nobody can. <laughs> it's a truly deep mystery at the heart of quantum mechanics called the measurement problem, the problem of why the quantum state collapses. However, I can give you a little bit of the answer, maybe even more than half of the answer. The reason you don't see the superposition, the entangled state, is because it is actually further entangled with the surrounding environment. So, get rid of this. We really shouldn't think of the Hilbert space as being, you know, H position tensored with H spin. Right? We should really think of the Hilbert space as being these two things further tensored with some Hilbert space that describes the quantum state of the surrounding environment. So I'll write ENV for environment. So let's think about what happens when our particle actually hits the back wall. So the back wall is you know, also made up of quantum particles, you know, atoms, and these atoms also have wave functions. So when the particle hits the back wall, it will displace, you know, some of the atoms that comprise the wall. And 
Those atoms which got displaced will therefore displace other atoms, and so on and so forth. And eventually this displacement will, you know, spread to the air molecules in the room. And the and these, you know, this displacement will have a sort of exponential runaway effect in the environment. So the evolution of the state here is actually going to be different because of the environment. So it's not really going to be like this. It's going to be more... like this, like what I'm about to write here. So this initial state here should also be tensored with some initial environment state. So I'll write E and environment initial, initial environment state. And this will evolve not into this, but into, well, this first component tensored with some final environment state, I'll write F comma up, so what the environment will be if the particle hits the back wall, you know, in the upper position. And then on the bottom, we have to tensor it with E and V final down. Where generically, what you're going to find is that the inner product of the final environment state uh, if the particle hits the back wall in the upper position, so environment F up with environment F down. You know, the absolute value of this inner product squared is generically going to be much less than one. In fact, I'll write like three of these. So like really, really, really small. And this is just because the environment you know, the, the stuff surrounding the experiment and the room and the building and, you know, the state or, or whatever. Um, the environment has a lot of degrees of freedom. And in general, you know, because the environment is kind of chaotic, um, these, two st these two states, you know, environment F up and environment F down, they're sort of going to be two random states out of the environment. And any two random states in a very high dimensional Hilbert space are going to have very, very, very little overlap. So, right, so you can see that the, the final state is further getting entangled with the environment and entangled very strongly. So, you know, it's not just that, you know, this and this are entangled, it's that it's further entangled with this. So there's sort of a, a th three things getting entangled here. So from this brief overview I've given, you, know, you can sort of get an inkling that we don't see the entangled superposition state because the environment itself measures our whole experiment in the sense that the environment you know, becomes entangled with it. So this story I've been laying out here of environmental entanglement, this is the story of quantum decoherence. This is a very, very important thing, quantum decoherence. It's all about how stuff in quantum mechanics gets entangled with the environment, and in doing so, seems more and more like classical physics in the sense that, you know, particles, you know, will seem to be in one position, not in two positions, and so on. So I haven't fully explained quantum decoherence here. I've just sort of given the main idea um, that environmental entanglement prevents you from seeing, you know, superpositions that, that seem weird. But hopefully I've sufficiently piqued your interest so that you know you go and look it up for yourself because it's a very, very important process. And it's really why we don't see quantum mechanics in a regular life. It's, it's really due to quantum decoherence. There's a, there's a really good book about decoherence written by a fellow named Maximilian uh, Schlosshauer, which is called Quantum Decoherence. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, I think this book is definitely the, the best place to learn it. I, I highly recommend this book. But yeah, that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. And in fact, this is the end of my entire series on quantum spin. Wow, what a journey it's been making these videos. I had no idea it would take me this long 
to finish them all, but I kept realizing I had you know, so many more things to say. The thing about this, uh, this subject, you know, just quantum spin, is that you can really get a sense of all of quantum mechanics just by studying this one sort of very simple system. In some, in some sense, the simplest system, just, you know, just uh, two-dimensional complex vectors, you know, very closely. You know, and in this, and in this example, the whole world of quantum mechanics just opens up. You can learn about basically every facet in, in quantum mechanics, you know, just this one simple example. So if you've watched, you know, some of these videos, you will have actually learned stuff that applies to way more than just quantum spin. You'll, you'll, you're basically ready to learn um, more or less anything in, in the subject of quantum mechanics. You know, we've sort of taken this very unified path through it that, that passes through, you know, all sorts of amazing subjects. Anyway, thank you so much again. I hope you felt as though this was a valuable experience, and I'll see you again next time.